there's a lot of reasons in Indian culture why you need a, a, a native name. Uh, not the least of which is to pass over. That's probably the big, the big one. Uh, needing a native name has much more meaning than that, however. What it does is it gives you a direction in life. It, it doesn't give you like any magical powers or anything like that. What it does is it gives you something to attach yourself to, and that something that it, you attach to can actually become probably, in many cases, one of the biggest influences in your life because you have some place to go when things start getting tough. Uh, we issue native names in many, many different ways, I've, and you have to do it in a way that connects with that highest level, that spiritual level of, of intellect. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain this and start dissecting it a little bit as we go through this uh, uh, story. So uh, back in about the year 2000, uh, I'm sitting in my, my living room in, in my house, and I had a, a horse ranch at the time up in Minnesota. And we were also a therapeutic foster group home. And there's a lot of people who used to come to our property to do sweat lodges. We had a, a, uh, about a 35-foot roundhouse that we built. Uh, and we had a sweat lodge literally inside the roundhouse so we could do sweat lodges in the winter. It was heated, it was lighted. Uh, it was a pretty nice facility for, for what we were using it for. We did all kinds of ceremonies, weddings, you name it. We did a lot of stuff in there. Uh, I should add too that the building of the house was pretty much therapy for me. So it, there was a lot of uh, heart and soul that went into that roundhouse. In the front door of our house, and I think I've explained this before, you come right into the living room. This side of the living room, there's a stairway downstairs. If you go straight in, you're going to run into the dining room, then you go around a corner, there's the kitchen, which comes around, connects back to the living room. Down the hall, there's bedrooms and rest in the, in the bathroom, and so on and so forth. So we're just sitting around one day, uh, sort of, kind of gathering ourselves, and uh, uh, so in the living room here, we had a big picture window. Underneath the picture window, we, I think we had the TV at that time. And then our basset hound usually sat in front of the TV and didn't move much throughout the course of the day. Uh, I was sitting over here next to the railing. Uh, this side, remember, was the stairs going down there. Over here was a, a chair uh, that my wife at the time was sitting in. And then we had a couch over here. And back of the couch, there would have been a sort of a walkway to everything else. So we get a knock at the door. And I went over to the door, and I looked out the door, and there was a familiar face there, a person that I've known for years and years, well, I thought I knew for years and years, uh, for our fasts. And she didn't look well. I mean, she looked like she was sort of, looked like she might have been crying or something. So I opened up the door and, and invited her in and found out that indeed she was crying. She said that her daughter, who was going to uh, Moorhead, uh, the university up there for a while, was really, really struggling with a lot of different things and said that, uh, so she said that her daughter needed an Indian name. Her daughter didn't tell me this, mind you, but she said her daughter needed an Indian name. And I said, well, what brings you to that? And, and she said, well, why don't I just have you, her tell you? So I looked outside and I didn't see anybody. And then I looked over toward their car and sure enough, she was scooted down in the car and just barely, you could just see her eyeballs there. And, uh, and then the, the person, uh, we'll just call her Jane, the person Jane in the house said, well, she, she won't come in. Uh, and I said, well, you know, we, we can't really do much unless she comes in. Why don't you go talk to her? So she went out and talked to her and, and uh, just refused to come in. So Jane came back in the house and then I said, well, I'll go out and talk to her and see if I can get her to come in the house. So I went out and talked to her and I pretty much told her, let's just appease mom and just come in. We'll have a cold drink and, you know, just sit and talk. So she agreed to come in. And uh, so she comes in and the body language was, was really, really interesting because mom sat over here on that end of the couch and she sat on this end of the couch and uh, their legs were like crossed away from each other, their arms were closed, and you could tell that this hadn't been a very good day. And, uh, and I looked at... Uh, uh, yeah, let's just name it. Let's call her Mary. That's not her name. So I looked at Mary and said, uh, uh, what's going on? And then her mom answered. And Jane said, well, she's really struggling in a lot of things. 
you know, her boyfriend left her, she's not doing well in school, her job is kind of iffy, and, and just went on with the whole list, and you could tell that she didn't want this talked about, that Mary did not want this brought up in front of people that she didn't necessarily know. Now, here's the interesting thing. I'd known Jane for probably about 15 years, and I never knew she had a daughter. She never spoke of her daughter. Not one single time did I ever hear her talk about her daughter. And her daughter did spend most of her time at her father's house. But you would think the conversation would bring up her daughter at some point. But it really never did. Uh, and, you know, we never really got into that, any, any kind of depth in our conversations or anything like that, I don't think. Uh, but I just thought it was odd. So I, I again looked over at Mary and said, so what's going on? And again, Jane answers for Mary. And I, I finally said, you know, let's let Mary do some talking here. And you could tell that Mary liked me talking to Jane like that because she sort of smiled a little bit. And I, and I, and I felt like that might have been sort of a breakthrough right there. So I took advantage of it. And I said, uh, why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself? And it was one word answers, the kind of answers that like when you're doing your interview you don't want, right? It was like uh, she told it, she said her name, she said, and I said, well, what's your major? And she said her major, didn't expound on anything. And I said, well, what's, what's going on? I mean, your mom seems to think you're having lots of problems. Then she rolls her eyes and said, well, maybe a little bit. And, and so it was like pulling teeth. So I thought, well, I got to do something else. So I offered them both a, a, a soda. You guys want, want a soda or something? So they both said yes, so I got up and went into the kitchen and uh, came back and gave them each a soda and, and we sat and talked and, and I thought, well, maybe the best thing to do is just to sit and wait this out. Sometimes that works. So I popped my can of Coke and I'm drinking it and, and I decided that I was just going to kind of wait it out. And, and, uh, and I said after a little bit, I said, have any dreams or visions or anything like that? And she says, well, I, I want to be a nurse someday. And I said, oh, that's a noble profession, you know, being a nurse. It's one of the few things that you can do as a woman that you can actually support yourself with in this, in this day and age. And she said, uh, yeah. And then, then she waited a few more minutes, and she was thinking about it, and she kind of realized, I think, that those weren't the dreams I was kind of talking about. And she says, well, and I... So I was surprised, and I looked up, and she says, "I did have a dream about uh, uh, some turtles." And I'm, what? You dreamt about turtles? And that's exactly what I was trying to sort of get at, right? And she said, "Yeah, I, I dreamt about some turtles." And you could see her mom looking at her, and she's—you could tell that, that that was a surprise to her as well. And uh, so I said, "Well, tell me about the dream." And she said, "Well." The dream went like this. She said, I was walking in the Beaver Islands. Now, the Beaver Islands are a set of islands in the Mississippi River, uh, just south of St. Cloud, that a lot of people will go to and, and sort of recreate at or whatever the case might be. But she said, I was, I was walking through the, the Beaver Islands down there in the water, in the river, and I looked back, and there were four turtles, painted turtles, following me. And I said, painted? How do you know that? She said, well, they were really colorful. And I said, they're colorful? color visions, black and white dreams. You, you never dream in color. If you have visions, you're, you're going to be having visions in color. So I said, oh, tell me about it then. And, and she says, well, I was walking and I was standing on rocks and every rock I walked to, she said, I saw the turtles following me. I said, oh, that's kind of interesting. Uh, did they say anything? I said, no, they, they didn't really say anything. Uh, they were just kind of walking behind me, and I said, oh, four of them? She said, yeah. Well, now, you all know by now that four is a big color, or a big number. So I'm, I'm thinking, well, uh, anything else about the dream? She says, no, but I, I walked a long way. She said, I felt tired, she said. And uh, so I started to walk toward the shore, and the, I looked back, and the turtles were still there, but when I climbed onto the shore, the turtles just turned back, looked at me, and and sort of smiled, she said. And I said, they smiled. And, I, and she said, yeah. And then they just kind of swam away. And I went, ah, oh, that's really interesting. Now, you may not realize it by just hearing this small, short portion of this story. There's a lot in it. I mean, there's a lot in that story. <laughs> then all of a sudden, her mom chimes in. And her mom said, oh, that's interesting because, you know, I had this dream about turtles 
up when, I, when we were fasting, and I said, oh, really, what, what was that dream about? What I'm doing is I'm trying to get her to talk a little bit, so to get her to talk a little bit, so sort of loosen up the, the conversation, because it's still pretty tight. And she said, well, when you dropped us off, and we used to go from island to island and drop people off, prepare them, and I was 30 miles out, so on Eagle Island, and you're going to hear a story about that too, on Eagle Island, but on Eagle Island, uh, there's eagle's nest, and I was the last one to get dropped off, so I had to help everybody as we went. So by the time I got there, I was pretty tired. So uh, we dropped her off. So we went on there, and that island, you actually have to take a path up like this. And, and we have people set up on the top of the uh, hill there, and uh, that's where they do their fast. So she says, yeah, after you got us set up and everything, I went down, and I, I sort of kicked some rocks around and things, and I saw some turtles swimming around. But it was the next morning, she said, that, I, that this all started. And I said, well, tell me about it. She said she'd come down the path and she'd sit on a rock. And every morning there was this turtle sitting on the, the big rock there. And I said, oh, what kind of turtle? And she said, well, it looked like a box turtle except for one thing. And I said, well, what's that? She said it was colorful. I said, oh, the turtle there was really colorful, huh? And like, what colors? And she, she named the right colors. And... Uh, what, what turtles get like that because they have softer shells and they spend, and the, and the shells absorb the iron in the water and they turn really bright reds and all kinds of colors. Really pretty turtles. And she said, but I'd have this conversation and, and after a certain time the turtle would just turn around, sort of smile at me, jump in the water and swim away. I thought, oh, that's interesting. My wife at the time chimes in. <laughs> and she says, well, I, I had a dream too. And I said, oh, why don't you tell us about your dream? And she said, well, it was a time when we were on a fast, because I fasted with her uh, uh, one time. They used to, they, did, they actually do that as couples sometimes. So she said I was laying in the tent, and I was laying like this, with my head looking out the, the tent, because she had this little pup tent, and she said, up the path came this turtle. And she said, at first I was really, really scared, but there's something the turtle did that really set me at ease, and I felt really warm and connected to that turtle. And I said, well, what kind of turtle was it? She said, well, I think it was a colorful turtle like that, too. I said, oh, a painted turtle? And she says, I think so. I said, oh. And then, then I got to thinking about this, and, and I'd just come out of this experience with turtles. So uh, one of the things that I always like to do, and maybe some of you have been to St. John's University up in uh, up by Collegeville, up in, in uh just uh, west of St. Cloud. It's a beautiful place. Uh, so what I used to do is I used to go out there and I used to just walk across, walk around the lake. On the other side of the lake, only accessible by footpath, there's a there's an old abandoned chapel that's made out of granite. And during the building of that chapel, uh, a couple of Indian people actually fell and died and were buried underneath it as some sort of symbolism. So people used to kind of get sort of freaked out by that. Of course, there's, there's no reason to be freaked out by somebody being buried underneath that chapel. Uh, but there were no windows in it. It was just a nice place to hike to. It was a pretty long hike around there. And this lake was really pristine. No motorboats, nothing like that on it. You had to take canoes or kayaks or whatever the case might be. It's just a beautiful place. So I decided I was going to drive out there. And uh, on the way out there, I turn the radio on, and I hear that there's some weather coming. So I'm thinking, ah, maybe I won't go. And then I thought, ah, the heck with it. I'm just going to go. So I decided to take the back way in. And the back way kind of weaves its way through a really pretty dense wooded area and comes out around that lake and down around the lake and then there's a parking spot then you hike all the way over here to the chapel and I've got my little black jeep out and uh, I'm, I'm rumbling along and and uh, all of a sudden I had to stop and hit the brakes and I looked out there and I went holy crap and then right in the middle of the road there was a snapping turtle about this big maybe a little bigger than that even. and I thought oh jeez and I, then I started thinking, I'd make a nice shaker with that now. So I, I get out of the my, my, my old Jeep, which I just love, by the way. I'm a Jeep guy. So I get up there, and I, I'm looking around at it. and, and uh, So this is what you do with a snapping turtle that big, by the way. You step on the rear end of it, right? And lift it off the ground if you can. 
And if the uh, legs, if, they, if the turtle pulls you, its legs and its head in, you're okay. If it doesn't, you should probably leave the turtle alone. So I did that, and all the legs came in, the head went in. So I picked it up, and I was resting it on my hips and held my hands just out of its reach because if a snapping turtle gets your fingers, yeah, say goodbye, right? So I'm going, and, I'm, and there's a kind of a steep hill there, and I'm thinking, geez, what am I going to do? So I, I kind of walked down very carefully until I got down to the beach area there, and I set it down, and I kind of kicked the back of it a little bit, and it went into the water. The legs popped out. The head popped out. Looked back at me, and it sort of smiled, and swam away. I thought, oh, that was weird. So I climbed back up, got in my little rumble vehicle, and drove over and parked. Then I looked toward the west and I saw some pretty sizable thunderheads coming and I thought, oh jeez, you know, maybe I don't have the time to get out there. So I thought about it for a couple seconds and thought, ah, I'm going to go. So I put my bundle on my, uh, you know, over my shoulder and off I went. So I'm walking along and, and I'm kind of watching those clouds because they're, they're moving pretty fast and they're pretty high. The higher the cloud, the more you've got to worry about it, right? That's, that hot air is pushing those clouds up. So I'm walking along, and, and all of a sudden I reach this clearing, and I look down at, at the, the area down there, about 20 feet down, and there's logs and things in the water and rocks, but that wasn't the interesting part. The interesting part was there was, and I'm probably under-exaggerating this, thousands of turtles on those logs and stuff. Now this is the way turtles act. So right before a storm's coming, and you, they'll, they'll, they'll forecast the storm every time, They'll come up, get as much sun as they can, because during the storm they're going to swim down and get into the mud and ride out the storm. So I looked down there and I, I could not believe how many turtles I saw. I don't think I've seen that many turtles in my life. So I take my tobacco out and I, I say a prayer. Turtles are very sacred for Indian people, so I put my tobacco down and say thank you and off I go. And just as I reach there I start to hear the thunder. I mean it start. Here and I'm seeing the lightning going across the sky in the distance. I don't like crap. I, I just might get stuck here. I uh, didn't want to get stuck there, so I, I quick smoked my pipe and stuff. And 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 I thought it was quick. It actually took longer than I thought. So I did all that and uh, I went down to the lake and I saw all the bluegill. And then they all swam away. So I went up and and put my bundle over my shoulder, looked up, and the clouds are like right there. You can see that some. And it got pretty dark out at that. Point. So I'm thinking, oh, the sun's behind the clouds, and, and you could not see the sun. So these are pretty thick clouds. So off I go. And I'm trying to make sort of a beeline, walking pretty fast back around the lake. It's about a two-mile walk. So I'm going, and I get to where the turtles were before, and I look down, not one single turtle there. Not one. So I'm thinking, geez. So I take my tobacco up, put my tobacco down again, and, and I, I just thought that was odd that so many turtles would gather, and then so many turtles would be gone, all of them. So I'm walking again, and I get about halfway between the turtle place and my Jeep, and the clouds just opened up. I mean, it rained, and it rained, and, and, and it, it wasn't like it was windy rain yet, but it was coming down probably as hard as I've seen rain come down in my life. So I'm, 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 just, I'm instantly drenched, so I'm, I kind of pick up the pace, and I'm walking over there, and, and I get to the Jeep, open it up, I'm soaking wet. I put my bundle in, in the back seat, get in, and <laughs> off I go. Down the road I go, and then the wind started to pick up. I mean, it was it was pretty windy, and, and I looked out over the lake, and I saw one of the most cool things I ever saw. I saw lightning hit the lake. I don't know if any of you have ever seen lightning hit a lake, but what it does, it comes down, and it blows up, and then it goes out in all directions. It's really pretty cool. And you're safe in the car, right? because the wheel's touching the ground, it grounds it. So I'm, I'm driving and, and I'm watching this and all of a sudden I look ahead and I'll, I gotta stop real quick again. Said that damn turtle's back. So I'm thinking, oh great, now I gotta get out and move the turtle. Somebody somebody will run it over on purpose, right? You, you know people. So I, I turn, turn my vehicle off, open the door, no cars come in, so I went over and again I did the same routine to the turtle. turtle. And I, I picked her up and rested her on my sort of hip bones here, and I'm going down, and it's like, oh no. Before we had dirt, now we got mud, right? So I get over there, and I'm thinking, <sighs> I 
So my very first step, right? Right into the water. So I'm holding the turtle up, and the turtle never, its feet never came up. I'm thinking, jeez. So I'm full of mud, I'm soaking wet, I'm laying in the lake on my back, I got a turtle on top of me, and I'm thinking, what am I going to do? So I kind of inch my way back out, and uh, and uh, actually I set the turtle down for a second. The legs didn't come out, and I'm thinking, oh. So I picked the turtle back up, put it in the water, and it turned around and sort of smiled at me and swam away. So I thought, oh, jeez. And it took me about 10 minutes to get back up that hill. I mean, it, I was covered in mud. So I get up there and I'm thinking, well, maybe I'll just stand here a while and let the rain sort of clean me up a little bit. That's exactly what I did. First shower I had in a week anyway. So anyway, they, they, I got, it, it wasn't doing a lot of good, so I got in and blah, 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 drove home and got out of there. No. Got home and the phone was ringing. Literally walked in the door, the phone was ringing. Nobody was home either, which was interesting. So I picked up the phone. It's the old man. Gary, I just saw the moth. You've got to get up here right now because it's time to pick the bitter root. Manitoba. And I'm thinking, jeez. <laughs> so I, I changed my clothes and I took a quick shower, changed my clothes and, and took my bundle, took an extra set of clothes, left a note, and off I went. So I'm rumbling up in my, my Jeep because the car wasn't accessible at that time. It wasn't home. So up I go and... Uh, uh, so what's going on is there's a moth. It's when that moth appears and shows itself that you have to pick the bitter root. The bitter root is ready. So you, in order to pick the bitter root, now you have to be careful because there's two kinds of plants that look like bitter root. One is bitter root. The other looks exactly like it with a couple small exceptions. It's very, very poisonous. You don't want to get that plant. And if you know what you're looking for, it's pretty easy. But bitter root will grow on the edge of the swamp. So you've got to get your hands down into the mud to get the roots. And you bring the roots up, clean them off a little bit, snip them, and, and that's, that's how you harvest it. So I get up there, and it's a beautiful day up in, in Canada. So I, I'm glad I had the Jeep, too, by the way, because I'm going back through the woods, and I'm able to get through there. And I stop, and sure enough, there's the old man out there with his digging tools, and and he gives me the signal to come over, so I get out and I walk over, and, and he said, forgot your tools, didn't you? And I said, yeah. So he throws me one of those little garden shovels, and I get down and, and start digging and, and things, and, and I'm pulling up bitter root, cleaning it, and going right along, and all of a sudden the old man says, Gary, look. And he, this is how Indians point with, with their lips, because it's really impolite to point. That's one of the things, by the way, you're going to find out with some of your students. They won't point. So it goes like this, and I stand up, and I turn around, and I look down the beach, and I could not believe what I saw. First off, there were hawks and seagulls. And the seagulls are being very careful of the hawks, because the hawks like eat seagulls. But, but they had a better treat this day. Because down the beach was, and I'm underestimating this, millions of turtles, little baby turtles. Just heading toward the lake desperately. And the seagulls were coming down and trying to get those little tender turtles at the time. You know, and what the seagulls will do is the seagulls will pick their eyes out. Because that's the weakest link, right? They'll go after their eyes. So some turtles will actually live through that and spend their life blind swimming around. And apparently they do just fine. Uh, other turtles are scampering. You see turtles falling from the bird's talons and, and all that kind of stuff. The hawks are there to get the seagulls that are there to get the turtles. But the hawks will take a turtle now on that, too. I could not believe it. The whole beach was like black. And you could see it moving. And then they were gone. They were in the water. I'm like, holy crap, what, what did I just see? And he said, well, that's the turtles were born. The turtles are born when the moth comes out. I'm like, lesson learned, right? So we, we get done, and, and um, I hadn't seen that with turtles before. By the way, and I've dug out many of bitter root at that time. So we get all that done, and uh, I hop in the vehicle and, and start my way back down to Minnesota. Uh, I, I didn't. I wasn't going to stay the night. I was going to drive through the night and get back because I hadn't seen the kids, and I just needed to get back. So I'm driving through the night, and and uh, and I'm coming down uh, Highway 10 out of Detroit Lakes toward Royalton. 
through Minnesota and uh, had to stop. I said, turtles are in the road, box turtles, all along the side of the road. And I'm thinking, I'm going to run over these turtles, right? But every once in a while, you're going to find somebody in one of those trucks with the wheels this big, going to crush all the turtles they possibly can. So uh, I get back home, back to the couch here. So I'm sitting in my chair, and I just got done telling this story. And I'm looking at uh, Mary over there, and I'm thinking, huh. And Mary looks back, and she knows I'm thinking of something. And I said, I, I, I believe we just got your Indian name. And she looks at me, and she says, what? I said, I, I think your Indian name just came. So I got up, and I went into the bedroom. And I came back with a, it was a leather bag with something. And I'm sitting down on the couch and you know, on the chair again, and, and uh, take my pipe out, roll my pipe and everything. And she's just wondering what's going on. So at that point in time, I smudge everything down, go over and I smudge her. Remember when I went through the house cleansing everything? So you got to do that here too. And her mother and, and, uh, and my wife at the time, and, and I come back and set everything down. And then I, I, I sing this naming ceremony song, and then I announce her name. What's, what's her name? What is it? Turtle. Equate woman, turtle woman, the turtle woman. And so I said, the thing that you need to do now is study every single thing you can get your hands on about the turtle. Everything. You go to biology, you go to the library, you go to different Indian elders, you ask them, you go to different tribes, ask them every single thing you could possibly find about the turtle. All of the myths, all of the legends, everything that you can fit into your head. And if you have to write it down, write it down. Because that turtle is sort of like your mirror image. You, what we did is we just married you to that name. So the characteristics of that turtle are going to be the characteristics that you're going to carry in your heart for the rest of your life. And then I explained how important that turtle was. So I told a story about the, the turtle island. Uh, with the small animals coming up and packing turtle on the turtle's back and making Turtle Island during this flood. Another, one, another flood story that, that you probably haven't heard of before. So I also told her that in, because of that, the turtle got two very, very special gifts, this midterm, very, very special gifts, one of which was to see into the future and one of which was to see into the past. And I told her, I said, these gifts are going to present themselves to you at some point. If you recognize them, if you recognize when those gifts come, those gifts will serve you. So she's got this gift coming if she sees it when it comes. If it doesn't, that's fine, but it'll only come once. If you're lucky, it might come twice. But it'll only come once. You have to recognize it when it comes. If, it, if you recognize it, that's a gift that the Creator has given to you. The turtle's also blessed with longevity. Turtles can live to 200 years old. Really, really old turtles. So I said, that's another thing that you, you're going to have to pay attention to. And, 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 and you're going to have people coming to you for things. And so it took a long time to explain all this stuff. And then I, I gave her that gift, which was a turtle shell shaker. Um, we have some over here. Th these aren't the ones that uh, I gave her. I think they're in that third showcase back, right on the other side of the fancy dance feathers. But I said, you need to learn a turtle song. And when you're in sweat lodges and you're asked to say something, you sing that turtle song. Because that's your connection now. That's your destiny. Uh, you need to always remember that every turtle has 13 spaces on its back. 13 for the 13 tribes. 13 for the 13 clans of the Ojibwe, and 13 is an incredibly important number. And you might, you know, there's this black magic thing that 13, Friday the 13th and all that kind of nonsense. But 13 is a, a very, very good number for Indian people. And you have to really understand that too. So everything there is to understand about that turtle, you have to learn. You have to understand that because that turtle, in essence, is you. So that's one of the things that you need as you go through life is you need that Indian name. Something to connect yourself to. Something to attach yourself to. And it to you. 
So you are actually sort of conforming on the physical, the intellectual, the emotional, and the spiritual level. You've got to understand that. You've got to connect with that. Because that is your sacred name. So that's one way that names will come, right? And what I like to call that is a cluster. So you're sitting around and you're talking, and all of a sudden this cluster of stories appears out of nowhere. Well, there's significance to that. There's a reason why things happen, and that's the reason why that happened that day. She still carries that name, by the way. And she's still very proud of it. She's got turtles all over her. She's got a little live turtle. Uh, and all that kind of thing. So she's, she really connected herself to it. So what I look for is I look for clusters on that physical, intellectual, emotional, and spiritual level. And when those clusters come together, that tells me something. But I'm, you know, I'm to the age where I write things down because I can't remember everything anymore. So I'm waiting for those clusters to form. And when they form, we'll issue that indie name. And sometimes you get really close, and then all of a sudden, you realize it's for somebody else. Right, number two, over the course of my life, I've had to visit hospitals and things. But a lot of Indian people that you visit don't have Indian names, and they're getting close. You know what I'm talking about when I'm saying close. So you don't have time to allow this to happen. T time becomes a factor. I'll issue my first Indian name. A, there's a lot in that story, so that story has to follow that name. So if I in, issue somebody that name, I have to tell that story, and every time you issue that name, the story becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, and more significant, because everybody who carries that name then contributes from themselves that spiritual power goes back into the name. You follow me? So one way, another way to explain that is like with that shape. So I've got shakers that have been to four or five different people before they reached me. So every person that that travels through, they leave a portion of their spiritual power in that element. That's why these old things are so much more powerful. So what I'm doing then is I'm issuing that name and telling that story. And I can't tell you how many times they just, you can almost feel the relief in them because they're sort of panicked. So you issue this name, and then if, if everything's okay, like in a hospital, but they used to have a room that you, we can go to to burn sage and do a pipe ceremony and that kind of thing. You go there and do the ceremony all the time. And uh, this, just the sense of relief on someone's face is, is just amazing. And you know that you've done something good for them, because they know that at that point they're going to pass in the right way. So, uh, I've had to do that more often than, than you might think. That's another way that we issue these. Generally, I'll do it in a sweat lodge, but there's more ways to do it than that. Like I mentioned, when I got my first Indian name, it was a huge ceremony. Three men and three women, three women, and their duty was to remember the story that was given to me about the vision that, in which my name came from. And they would get quizzed afterwards to make sure. Their job for life is to keep me on that track, make sure that I stay on that track. It's part of that uh, spiritual Ashkabewis that I was talking about. So my Ashkabewis down here are constantly reminding me to stay on that path as I am them. So if they ever need anything, I've got to be there for them. So you can tell that that's another responsibility that you sort of have to accept or not. So when I was, when, I, when the vision came to my elder that I'm supposed to be giving Indian names years and years ago, I had to either accept it or not. If I didn't accept it, that's fine. The opportunity may never come my way again, or it might. If I did accept it, then I had to accept it wholeheartedly. It's an all or nothing thing. So at that point in time, uh, I felt that I needed to because it was part of a, another piece to the who I was becoming at that time, and I accepted it and uh, and have since given quite a few Indian names.